In this section, we are gonna talk about flatworms and roundworms. Um, it's gonna be pretty short, um, so you will be able to see what exactly the anatomy of a flatworm is, what are examples of it, um, and just how they function in their day-to-day -day life. So, um, one important thing about these flatworms um, and roundworms is that they show a bilateral symmetry, okay? So basically, this is an important term for you to know, and what this means is that they have equal sides to the animal. So if you cut them right in half, they're going to kind of have mirror images of both of their sides. So they're gonna kind of look like a reflection. So a lot of flatworms, they kind of look like this. So if I cut them in the middle like this, you can kind of see that both the sides are going to look identical to each other. So that's what bilateral symmetry means. So in um, a planarian, you probably heard of a planarian, especially in our class, we talked about it um, like in the beginning of the year. Um, it's basically a flat worm, okay? It's kind of, it's this thing that I drew in the previous slide. Kind of looks like this. Um, and it has a phylum and it's called plati platyhelminthes. And basically um, this is just what they're categorized, but what a flat worm is or a planarian is, is that they are free living. That means they do not depend on another organism for survival. So there are certain, um, you know, parasites and other types of worms that do need a um, something called a host. So we're going to talk about that in a couple seconds. But for these, they are generally free, li free living. Um, planarians are found in freshwater, um, soil, and oceans. Okay. This is kind of important when we talk about parasites, why um, it's important to wear shoes when you go out into the ground and on the soil and sand because there are um, parasites that can be found in soil and on the ground that can actually go up through your feet, which is kind of really gross um, and can really infect you. And obviously these are more common in third world countries. Um, so not as common here in America, but Ever since I learned about that, I do really, really try hard not to go out barefoot because it freaks me out. Um, so like I said, some planarians are free living. So some planarians are free living, um, but there are a group of them that are parasitic, um, which means that they pretty much live by living inside of another organism. So they live inside of an organism. That's what it means to be parasitic. Um, and the organism that they live inside that organism is called a host, okay? So say, for example, that a person contracts a tapeworm, which is a parasite. That tapeworm is a parasite. The human that has now contracted that tapeworm, that human is considered the host. Or if it was an animal, that animal is considered the host. Um, and then, like again, planarians do show bilateral symmetry, which means that they are identical in their half. So this half right here, is similar to this half over here. So let's talk about their nervous system. So a planarian doesn't have a brain as complex as us or other animals, um, but they have something called a response center and that response center is called a ganglion, all right? And that ganglion is sometimes referred to as the simple brain. So um, their nervous system basically is made up of this um, huge nerve that is going to run down both half of their body. Um, so there's going to be one on one side and the other on the other side, and that's going to be called the longitudinal nerve. So if I have a planarian here, I'm going to have this longitudinal nerve kind of just running on either side. Okay. And I have a picture to show you. So I'm just kind of briefly describing it as we go. And then they also have a series of transverse nerves that's going to connect to these longitudinal nerves and they're going to give um, pretty much make that whole inside nervous system of the planarian look like a ladder okay so i'm going to repeat that again they have a response center that's called a ganglion and it's usually like record uh, located somewhere up here they're going to have a longitudinal nerve which is what i drew right here and then they're also going to have um, a series of transverse nerves that are going to connect to the longitudinal like this and it's going to kind of give you a, like a ladder feel i didn't do it justice so let's look at it okay so here is an example of a planarian um it's a flatworm um and if you see that 
up here is my cerebral ganglia, which is my ganglion, their simple brain. So this is just referring to the simple brain that we talked about. And then you can see that they have their um, longitudinal nerve co uh, cords that are um, going down, right? So this is their longitudinal nerve. And then you also see that they have um, their transverse, which is going across. So you can see how it's creating like a ladder kind of look. Okay. So the planarian's ganglia um, is, which is pretty much, like I said, this is their simple brain, is going to coordinate um, responses as that organism responds to a certain stimuli, which means a certain factor. So for example, if that planaria, somebody touches it or something touches it, right? It's going to respond and that response is going to come from the ganglia, which is their simple brain. Um, so again, like I said, the stimulus is something that causes a reaction in the organism. Um, and then those stimulus is going to be converted to impulse and that is going to be sent through the body. So for example, if we have a planarian and some kind of something touches the planarian, it's going to your, their simple brain is going to say, Hey, something touched it. We got to move. And so that's going to be the impulse. The impulse is going to be, we need to move. And that's going to go throughout the body so that the body is now saying, oh, we just got a message from our brain that we need to move. So we're going to move and cause a reaction to happen. So um, planarians respond to a couple of things. One, they respond to touch, obviously, right? Everybody responds to touch. If something touches you and you're, you know, uh, especially predators and stuff, they're going to have to move. Um, so they're going to respond to that. Um, they also respond to the current and water. So basically, um, they swim upstream. So they're going to, you know, if they feel the current, they're going to figure out which way they need to move according to that. And also chemicals and water. Um, obviously, that's not the best thing, but um, I mean, to have in water, but they do um, are able to acknowledge it and respond to it. Planarians are also have this funky name and it's called cross-eyed worms. And I'm gonna show you in a second why they look cross-eyed. But basically they have these nerves um, that are called eye spots. And these eye spots are very important because they are sensitive to um, light. So they can sense when there is light and when there is not light. Um, and what they do is they want to get away from light because they, you know, they believe that when they are exposed to light, other organisms can see them and therefore they're more prone to being killed, um, which is kind of a way of protection. So they do have eye spots and um, they try to avoid it for predication, which basically means they don't want to get eaten. So here is our little planarian. Um, so you can see that they have eye spots right here. Um, and sometimes if you look at the eye spots, they kind of look like this, but they kind of look like they're cross-eyed, which is kind of funky. You can kind of see it right here. Um, and um, that kind of gives them the ability to sense light, okay? Um, I, it's kind of blurry in this picture. I have a better picture coming up, but you can kind of see the breakdown of the nerves and um, you can see the mouth over here that we'll talk to, uh, talk about. You can see the ganglia that's here, which is their little brain. Um, and then um, their gastrovascular cavity and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's talk about their digestive system. So basically, um, they have a mouth um, which is on the bottom middle part of their body. So if I drew my little panarian here, okay, their mouth is like kind of like right here, okay? Um, so that is going to be on the middle side of their body. Now, um, inside of their mouth, they're going to have something called a long branching cavity called the intestine. Um, and I will show you a picture of it, but basically that is what is going to take the food to help digest it. So the planarian is going to eat by extending a muscular tube called the pharynx, um, through the mouth and then sucking the food into its intestine. Now, <clears throat> an example of this is a tapeworm. 
So it has a head that has actually hooks on it um, and they're called suckers. So that suckers or those hooks are what is gonna attach to the digestive tract of a host because that digestive tract is where all of the food is and it will suck that food out and um, because that food is already digested, it's already nourished, it's um, dissolved, and it's going to pass through the body of the tapeworm. So if you ever heard of somebody who has a tapeworm, which is still pretty common, like I said, especially in third world countries, um, what happens is they will be eating constantly because they're not getting full. Why are, not, why, they, why are they not getting full? It's because this tapeworm is literally sucking all of that food um, out of that person's intestines into its own body through its suckers and so the tapeworm is getting bigger and bigger and let me tell you guys like please don't google this because it is really traumatic how big they can get and how nasty it is um, and it's really dangerous because you know you're not getting nourishment because all of your nourishment that you're consuming is going directly into this tapeworm um, so let's look at a picture of our planarian all right, so this is not a tapeworm, this is a planarian, it's a flatworm. But you can see that we talked about the brain, which is the ganglion, right? Um, you can see the eye spot, and you can really see here how they are literally cross-eyed, right? The parts that are sensitive to light. Um, so that gives you a good reference to that. And then you can see the mouth right here, okay? So this is the mouth right here. Um, and that mouth is connected to the pharynx. And that pharynx is what is going to help um, pretty much take in the um, food material so that it can go into uh, the rest of the body to be, you know, nourish the animal and to also digest it and um, consume it. So this is kind of a breakdown um, of what the inside of the worm looks like. And you can see the nerves are how they look, um, you know, like a ladder going down the entire planarian. Okay, so planarians um, also need to breathe, right? So they exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide, but they do this um, actually through their thin skin. So it's not like they have a nose or anything like us or other animals. They actually are just able to exchange gases through the thin um, thinness of their skin. Um, and this happens directly with their environment. Their excretory system. So basically this is how they get rid of waste, right? So they get rid of um, liquid waste um, through the these tiny tubes that they have aligned in the system. And at the end of these tubes that they have, they have something called flame cells, which are similar to the cilia. Remember when we talked about cilia are these tiny hairs that some cells have that help them to move? Um, they're not actually hairs, but they look like little hairs and they help the um, cell to move. It helps flow water over them. So at the end of these tubes um, that are used to get rid of waste are something called these flame cells, which are basically little cilia. And these cilia, they help to move water and waste through the tubes um, into tiny holes called the exc uh, excretory pores, okay? So they have these excretory pores um, which are these tiny holes and the cilia are going to help move water and waste through these tubes so they can come out and um, just keep the organism healthy. Okay, so if you look at um, this um, animal, you can kind of probably, it doesn't show it on here, but they have the cilia um, on these excretory tubes that allow them to come out. Um, and like I said, remember the mouth is here towards the middle bottom part of the body so that that's how they intake food. Okay, so this is kind of interesting. Planarians reproduce sexually, but the way that they do it is kind of very complicated and interesting, and that's because they are hermaphrod hermaphroditic, which basically means that they both have they one planarian can have both male and female reproductive organs. That doesn't mean that they mate with themselves because like I said, they are sexually. So basically um, one planarian will release the sperm to another planarian um, and then mate that way or they can release or they can have another planarian re uh, release their sperm to this, the same one that had just released its sperm to another one. So 
They can go either way, so they carry both female and male reproductive organs. Okay, last um, worm that we're going to talk about in this is called the Ascaris, um, which is a roundworm. Um, their phylum is Nematoda. Um, basically, these worms are round. They have tubular bodies um, that are tapered at each end. Um, a common roundworm is called Ascaris, which is found in the intestines of different kinds of animals like um, pork, beef, um, and this is one of the most common parasites in humans. Um, there are other roundworms that are parasites like the hookworm. Um, this stuff you can find in the ground. Um, this is why it's dangerous to walk on soil without any shoes because they can actually get in through your feet and go into your lungs and it's really dangerous. There's also pinworms and chikina worms. Okay, so here is an example of um, a parasite. So if you look here, um, the parasite can have eggs in a certain environment. So say that these eggs are on grass, right? Um, a cow will maybe come up and start eating that grass that has those eggs, right? Super gross. Once that cow has eaten the grass that has the eggs, the eggs will start to take plant in the muscles of the cow and it will start to lay, um, they will start to grow. Now a human that is now um, eating this meat, which is the beef, right? Burgers, steak, they're all muscle of an animal. So if you're eating a burger or a steak, which comes from a, a cow, and you haven't cooked the meat well, so this is why it's super important to make sure that your meat is cooked at a really good temperature. Um, people who eat pork, you know, those are more harder to contract um, diseases and illnesses from because it's you have to be very careful how it's cooked. Um, but if any meat that you ingest that is undercooked, um, you have to be really careful because you can be exposed to certain parasites. So if a human eats this undercooked muscle, um, which is right here, okay, they can um, contract this parasite which will um, implement itself into the intestine of the human. Um, and then the humans can actually um, get rid of the eggs through their feces. And sometimes, depending on where the feces goes, what it's used for, it can end up somewhere like grass, um, and which is then again consumed by an animal, like a cow. Um, that cow is now having these eggs in their muscles. A human eats the eggs, which are in their meat because it's uncooked, remember undercooked, um, and then that's how they get infected, okay? So that concludes our 12.3 or 12C, I'm sorry, 12C um, section. Please look out for announcements that will, or assign.